The purpose of this video production is to introduce the idea that there are many concrete avenues and alternatives available for healthy recovery from sexual abuse. We're going to explore sources of violence and the different kinds of abuses with a special focus on sexual abuse. In order to heal the present and to build a healthy future, elders tell us that we have to understand where we come from. So what is violence? Violence is the violation of a person mentally, emotionally, physically, or sexually. And some examples could be in the form of name calling, swearing, fighting, inadequate physical or emotional care of a child, and of course, sexual abuse. Sexual abuse comes in many forms, and some examples of sexual abuse might be inappropriate touching or fondling of a person, Letting children watch X-rated videos or movies on TV. Sexual harassment and also rape. Did you know Michael went to court today? Oh really? Yeah, uh, he's getting charged for beating up his wife. Is Michael going to jail? Uh, they just set a trial date, but he'll probably get charged. Give me that! Shut up, you punk! Uh -huh. I told you to! Do give it back! Shut up! Hey, why don't you guys just sit down and shut up? Shut up, for! Give that back, you punk! Little brat! Shut up! to go home. The kids are gonna, the kids are up. Gotta make some mush. Hey, one more beer and that's it. I promise. No, I said the party's over. Tell everybody to go. Luke, you got nobody at home. We can go there for a few hours. Yeah, sure. Let's go. Hey, you wanna come over just for a couple of rounds and that's it for me. I gotta get some sleep. No. No? No! Don't go trap! Which means no. You always leave me home alone! I hate you! Go ahead, Sarah. Ah! I said. Yes, you're my wife. No, don't, don't need question. No, Daddy, don't. Everyone has a right to care and protection of self. When anyone is in a position of power, strength, 
authority or a position of trust and violates that right, that is abuse. Sexual abuse is not usually about sex. It is usually about power and control over another. Low self-esteem of the victimizer. When we are silent about sexual abuse, we can contribute to enabling another generation of abuse to carry on. If we are able to stop multi-generational sexual abuse, we must break the conspiracy of silence and begin to educate ourselves so we can begin the journey of recovery. Well, good evening, everybody. This evening, we're going to uh, spend a little bit of time talking about multi-generational grief, as well as uh, understanding how the effect of that multi-generational grief affects our families today, as well as the community as a whole. So I'd like to start off by sharing a little bit, perhaps using a definition so that we are all thinking the same thing as we go through the session. The first one that I want to define is just the word grief itself. There's a lot of definitions for it. But let's use the one that I most often use when I'm working with families. And that definition is grief is the spiritual response that we have when we lose someone or something that is of deep meaning to us. And the thing to remember about that is it is not an enemy, but it's a natural systems movement towards restoring our own wholeness. So I'd like you to keep that in mind as we go along. The other word that I'd like you to, to be aware of is multi-generational trauma, the word trauma. Trauma has a lot of definitions. For instance, trauma is the pain that we continue to experience long after an original hurt has happened. And that many, many years later, we are still affected by that hurt we may have suffered you know, way back when. That's, that's one definition of trauma. Uh, another way of defining trauma is, is when we stimulate emotion or feeling and then block the release of that feeling. So for an example, if a little four-year-old sees his father hitting his mother, he's terrified and he starts to scream and cry. And if that father said, shut up, be quiet, he, you know, witnessing the violence stimulates the emotion of terror. When he is told to shut up, be quiet, you're blocking the release of that terror that's been stimulated, eh? So that's another way of looking at trauma. So tonight when we talk about multi-generational grief, multi-generational trauma, keep those definitions in mind. So let's go way back. We always talk about, you know, the different losses that our people have gone through. You know, the loss of land, loss of culture, loss of language, loss of belief systems. So we know all that. But perhaps one of the things that we don't talk a whole lot about is what we might call our spirit history. You know, the history of the spirit of our people, the feelings that they had when all those losses were going on. So for instance, if we were to take a look at, at you know, the um, the Indian people being moved, you know, onto reservations and taken away from their traditional lands. What do you think the people felt? We never talk about that, eh? When we, when we hear about all the children that were taken away to boarding school over so many generations, we talk about, you know, the loss of children to the residential schools. But we don't much talk about what do you think the moms 
and the dads and the grandmas and grandpas felt when those little children were taken away. Mr. and Mrs. Anaquart, this is the Trove Society. We have decided to take your son to residential school. He shall be provided with a good education. Don't worry about John. Everything will be all right. He'll be fed and clothed as soon as we get to Spanish. Okay, <laughs> and that there was nothing that those grandmas or those grandpas could do about that. When I, so that's what I'm talking about when I say the spirit history of our people. And that's really what multi-generational grief is. It is the unexpressed sorrow that we carry generation after generation, you know, for all the losses that have gone on. The media. TV, radio, music, outside influences in our community affects a great deal on how our attitudes and behaviors are. Alcohol and drug abuse, as well as other substances. No jobs can lead to no money, to pay bills, to feed, to clothe our families, and this can create enormous stress, which then creates conflict. Not being able to express our feelings can lead to acting out and acting on our feelings, such as anger. These are just some examples that can contribute to violence. When a baby is born into a family of trauma, he has jobs to do, you know, in the first years of his life. And when that baby is born, from the time that he is born till maybe he's about two years old, he has one job. And the job is trust versus mistrust. He has to answer the question, is the world a friendly place to be? Or is it a hostile place? If it's a friendly place, then the way that he's going to be treated is he's going to be loved, nurtured, nourished. People are going to sing songs to him. People are going to cuddle him, give him a clean diaper, good bottle of milk. And the answer he's going to learn is, yes, the world is a friendly place. And because of his experience, he's going to learn to trust the people in his society that he's growing up in. When we think traditionally, our people years ago, when our culture was intact, they had a way of letting that baby know, yes, the world is a friendly place. We had what might be called welcoming ceremonies, that as soon as that baby entered this world, we welcomed that child. Sometimes it was called the blessing of the first cry. And all that family would gather and tell that baby, we're so glad you're here. Welcome. I'm going to teach you to sing. I'm going to teach you to dance. I'm going to tell you stories. And that's the way our people used to do it. We knew what we were doing. But if that baby is born into a family of trauma where there's drinking going on, where there's violence going on, and mom is passed out and doesn't change that baby's diaper, 
That baby gets up, you know, on a Sunday morning and his bottle of milk is sour and nobody tends to him. Very soon that baby learns, no, the world is a hostile place to be. It is not safe. So within the first two years of life, we learn not to trust the world. So when we look at Native people in the tremendous families of trauma that we have all come from, it is no wonder that we don't trust one another because it perhaps has happened right from the time that we were born, depending what we came into. When that little baby is between the ages of about maybe two till maybe about six years old, he has two jobs. Between the ages of two to maybe about three and a half, his job there is to be an explorer, to find out the wonder of the world that he has come to. And he's busy checking out things. And one of the jobs he learns is boundaries. I am safe. It is called the ego strengthening years. His spirit is getting strengthened. And if that baby is allowed to explore, but his parents make sure that he's safe and doesn't get hurt, that baby learns to trust himself and he continues to learn to trust the world around him. But if that little baby is not allowed to explore, if that little baby, you know, is being abused and not being taken care of, that baby doesn't know how to strengthen his own spirit and he becomes fearful of the world. When he's around three and a half or so, till he's about six, his job changes. And the new job he has is, what do I have to offer to the world? All of a sudden, he realizes he's not the only one in the world. See, right around two, eh? They think the whole world centers on them. But at around three, three and a half, it all, all of a sudden it dawns on him, there's all these other people, you know, that share the world with him. And he wants to be a part of that. He wants to belong. This is the little three and a half year old toddler, the four year old, who is forever wanting to help you. Usually he's just getting in the way, eh? He makes more work for you. But he's busy doing his job. What do I have to offer to the world? If that little baby is not allowed to share the world and to, you know, not taught, that little baby learns shaming. And if that little child is molested between those years, between two and six, he learns body self-hate. He knows that something very, very wrong has happened. He doesn't know what it is but he knows something was not right. And so he learns body self-hate. And, and sometimes, you know, that tremendous violation even makes him split his spirit, you know. And a lot of times, you know, what we call that is um, loss of memory because it's the only way that the child can protect himself from that experience. And then this little child who's growing up in this family of trauma becomes six years old. These are called the childhood years between six and 12. And in these childhood years, these are called the years of industry, the time of doing. I can do. I am confident because I am competent and I am competent because I am confident. The little child who is nourished in these years, he gets messages like, boy, what a nice boat you made. What a great report card you have. What a beautiful little doll you drew. 
and that little kid just fills up with confidence. But the little child who's told in those years, you're so stupid, can't you do any better than that? Why can't you be more like your sister? What's wrong with you? You'd lose your head if it wasn't attached to you. The child who gets those kinds of messages continues to build shame as part of his identity. I am no good. I am not worthy. And that little child doesn't learn how to get along with people because these are the years of strengthening socialization skills, being able to get along, to cooperate, to play with. By the time that child is 13 years old or is entering puberty, he has a final job to do because he's almost finished growing as a child. And the job that he has is, who am I and where am I going? And for the next six, seven years, he must find the answers to that. Now for the child who's grown up nourished and loved and supported, he's going to check it out. He may kind of go off the path that he's been taught because that's part of separating yourself from your parents. But if he's been taught well, he will come back to the original things that he has been taught about being a good human being. But what about the child, you know, who hasn't been taken care of from the time he was born? The child that was left in the crib, the child that was molested, the child that was shamed, the child that received all those negative messages, the child that was left to raise younger brothers and sisters while mom and dad went out drinking. What happens to that child? One of the things that we're learning now is that that young child at 13 years old, you know, around puberty time, all of a sudden he wakes up and he finds out that he had a right to a protected childhood. I had a right to be loved. I had a right to be nourished. I had a right to be protected. And I never got any of it. And what you have on your hands is a profoundly grieving child. A child who is fearful, a child who is outraged and angry because he didn't get what he was supposed to get, and a child who is in profound sorrow for the loss of his childhood. And because this child may have grown up in a family of trauma where one of the rules is don't talk, <coughs> this child has not learned how to express the feeling that he's feeling, eh? all those feelings. And so, <coughs> what you have on your hands is a profoundly grieving child who is probably going to be stuck in one of those grief emotions. And the grief emotion that he is more than likely going to be stuck in is the emotion of rage. Because as we know, adolescent time is a time of hormonal changes. The body is changing very, very fast. And that young teenager feels like he's out of control because he can't control the feelings that he's got. He also has profound feelings, eh? Like the feelings are very, very intense. And he's no control over them. So if you have an angry teenager, your teenager is very, very, very angry. If you have a happy teenager, you have a, 
you know, probably the happiest human being in the whole wide world. The feelings are very extreme. Well, as we all know, because many of us come from families of trauma, and certainly all of us come from multi-generational grief history, we more than likely have teenagers who are profoundly grieving, caught in the emotion of rage that they can't express. So what do they do? They act it out. It comes out by action. And what do we see in our communities today? We see vandalism, destruction against property, we see verbal violence and physical violence of our young people with one another as well as within the family system. So destruction against person. And we see rage being acted out in so many ways. Pius, Nimki. You're late again. Go on to the principal's office. So we'll smoke before we see the principal. There you go, boy, Dar. I've been waiting for you in my office. Now you're really in trouble. Follow me. Shit! That's it. Now you're both suspended. Mayor, just look at us. There's smoke in the boys' washroom. Yeah, so? door open. Isn't this how we do things? Healing and recovery is possible because you matter. Here in Wikwemakong we have a lot of programs and services as well as individuals who are able to provide support, who are able to provide counseling in working through this issue. I think the important thing to remember is that sexual abuse recovery is a long journey, but it doesn't have to be done alone. And what I'd like to also uh, remind all of us is that the important thing about beginning to do this work is to recognize the key is to honor the stories that we share with one another, the whole idea of holding these stories in our confidence um, is very critical when we start to do this work. I'd like to identify with you some of the places that we can go that already exist in Wikwemakong that provide the support that we may need to do this work. The Wikwemakong Health Center offers a wide variety of programs we have programs such as Nodmodwin. We have the Nodwendida program as well. And even within the health center, we have many different health center personnel, such as the CHRs and the nurses and the doctors that service the center. They are all there available to help. We have the family center that operates out of the band office and that has a strong home visitation program, if that's where you want it to start. They also sponsor group activities. The Wequemekong Board of Education provides school counselors to work with children and young people in the community. We also have Rainbow Lodge, the Wequemekong Youth Center, and of course we have the church and the resources that the church offers. There is also private counseling and support at the Medicine Lodge 
that is available on request. Other services in our community include Omnicook, the Wequemekong Heritage Organization that sponsors community gatherings that help people come together. We have the Hub Center that works with our tiny children. And of course, Kina Bejigoming that serves not only our community, but Manitoulin Island communities as well. Our community will continue to work at responding to our community members' needs as they are identified. Ani, not more than connect the Manda. I think uh, I need some help. Yeah, my son is showing some signs of um, abusive behavior. When? Who? Okay. No, me glitch. I think it's also important to celebrate ourselves. No matter what has happened in our life, we need to celebrate that we have had fortitude, we have had perseverance, and we have had endurance in order to survive our journeys this far. I grew up in the city. I grew up in Sudbury most of my life, and there was a short time when I was uh, very young, I think I was grade, grade two, that we came back home to live in Wiki for a couple of months, and it was actually here that I had started running because when we were in our phys ed class, uh, we had to run out towards you know Murray Hill and come back, and end up that, I'm not sure who it was, but I ended up beating supposedly who was the fastest girl in that class, so that's how I started running, and I've stayed with it ever since then. I've always had my running, you know, to focus on. I think if the youth um, of Wiki and the youth of Cross Canada have something to focus on, whether it be, you know, sports or whether it be they're learning about their culture or their language, you know, just something to focus on. The whole point of being nominated to this International Nay Role Model Program is each and one of us, we promote a healthy lifestyle in different ways. Like with me, it's my running that I'm able to promote a healthy lifestyle. On behalf of all the people of Canada, I wish you, the role models of this year, every success. The role models follow the seven native traditions of wisdom, truth, honesty, love, respect, bravery, and humility. Many Canadians outside the Aboriginal community would like to think that we share some of the same attitudes. Indeed, many think of Canada as a role model for other nations. But when Canada came into being, who were the first role models? Our French and English pioneers came to a continent that was populated. The First Nations greeted us with generosity and friendship according to their spiritual beliefs and the way of life. From them we learned the medicines, the food, the clothing we needed for survival. We learned to use their canoes, their snowshoes, their toboggans for transport. And we learned from them the rivers and the waterways that took us into the heart of a continent. Those Europeans who took the time to observe the native societies described a culture of consensus, of cooperation, and of sharing. I would now like to present Sarah Baudry from Ontario. An Ojibwe, originally from the Wikwemekong First Nation, Sarah Baudre resides in Sudbury, Ontario with her five-year-old son, named after her role model, Alwyn Morris. Running has always been Sarah's passion, and she actively competed in the sport for over 10 years, including the Cambrian College Women's Cross Country Running Team and the North American Indigenous Games in 1990, taking home one gold, one silver, and two bronze medals, 
and a silver medal at the 1995 Games. Sarah believes that role models are essential for Native youth today as a symbol of hope for the future. Sarah Beaudry. My hero, I think, would have to be, is Alwyn Morris, number one, because, you know, he did win the Olympic gold medal, and there was a time when I was young, I did want to go to the Olympics. And that's something I still, you know, dream about, and who knows, you know, maybe I'll be in the Olympics someday. A uh, personal uh, connection I have to promoting Native awareness is to uh, make sure that uh, everybody is treated fairly, that there's no racism in this school, because that, you know, that can affect people. It could bring down the Natives' marks, while the others would be getting higher marks and they're like being exactly the same. The Three Fire Student Confederacy Council is a council formed for Native students and it was formed just like a year ago because of what happened a couple years ago they shut it down and they just started it up recently. Um, the reason why we started it was because we felt that Native students needed a council because there's only a students council for like the school so we thought a Native student council would help. The purpose for its formation is to get ideas and concerns from Native students and what they want to see in the school for them, um, such as powwows, uh, drum sessions, workshops, uh, guest speakers. なんごまんとこんてえあちべもちじゃがいびのまんとこんてきますかとしな。まんだそれビューセデミ。パネゴまんとべとこ。パネゴとこしこんごばけもちあてもちじゃ。まんごなんでたっこしゃむかった。たこ
Minne saa on veel uusi. Ispäst on tappa näe nõuab maalt nemdedat nemt tauget kuna. Aga see, kui ma avan nõu, saa jääb veel uusi. Või ei nii kuna aga ta enda. Minna kui äsku ma ette nõuab taan poolt vatsene pitsem tedat ei sööb teda nüüd see jääb. So everybody in the family, the extended family, had a hand in discipline. It wasn't a cruel type of discipline. Usually it was a verbal reprimand. And we did something wrong, we were told what we did wrong and why it wasn't right to do those things. So that kind of a teaching of discipline is more effective than beating the heck out of somebody. Everybody makes mistakes. And we were very tolerant people to the point where at this stage in time it's become rather it's a hindrance rather than a rather than a, a help in the fact that the kinds of things that are happening now or in the past few years would never be condoned in the old traditional way like sexual abuse of children and sexual molestation and rape and those things <coughs> where uh, looked down upon in this community and they weren't tolerated but in this day and age there seems to be a lot of tolerance for some reason I suppose it's because of that non-interference <clears throat> so in recent years we've had to change or adapt our traditions to contemporary ways see in the past it wasn't necessary to interfere if there was a case of sexual abuse for instance of children or any kind of molestation of that that nature We've had to change our ways where now we have to adapt to this new phenomena of sexual abuse. We do have to interfere and, uh, for the protection of these children and whoever is being abused, even the wives that are being beat up by their husbands. It's uh, very rare that I saw that happening in the, in the culture that's seen in the 1940s and 50s, but now it's a very common thing. And uh, according to our, our tribal police, most of the, the calls that they do get are of a domestic nature where couples are fighting and, you know, there's danger of somebody getting severely injured or may, maybe actually getting killed. So uh, not to interfere is the wrong thing to do. We do have to interfere. <clears throat> and I believe the, the, the council of the day has to take a stand on behalf of the community in regards to this abuse of any kind against other human beings. Uh, <clears throat> I guess a policy of zero tolerance is what I'm talking about. A lot of these changes occurred, I suppose, when the Indian people or the native people lost their spirituality, their spiritual values. Because when the Western European brought their, their spiritualism to this country, it didn't necessarily differ that much from our way of doing things. But then again, it did in certain ways, in subtle ways. First of all, uh, I guess the Christian religions and the Far Eastern religions preach that man is dominant over woman. So uh, <clears throat> we're in that mentality now where that's happening in our own community. There's uh, very little respect for the women of this community. <clears throat> But that wasn't the way in the old culture in this area women had a very prominent place in fact they had the most important job of a parent and that was actually raising the children the man's role was to support the raising of those children but when that same child is scared like maybe thunder and lightning coming on or there's a wild animal in the bush he'll seek out his dad so there's two roles there the woman is a natural healer and the man's role is a protector And the child automatically senses that at a very young age, not knowing the culture, you can't apply cultural ways to handle their, what, whatever is bothering them, whether it's be emotional or physical or whatever. Try to retrain people or teach them about their own culture, which takes time, It takes a lot of time. So that takes away from the actual help that these people need right away. If you understand your own culture, then <clears throat> you can't possibly relate to our ways of doing things. There was a certain amount of tradition that's always been under reserve, and it's very evident. 
The Kwamakong is probably one of the most traditional reserves you'll find any place, yet it's very modern. But the people have hung on to the old values to a certain extent. They shared, they were sharing things. Unfortunately, yet we've lost a lot of that, this sharing, helping each other out. It's more or less like we're caught up in a materialistic world and we're still adapting to it. It seems that everyone for himself is a prevailing mood. And uh, that carries on over into raising children. Encourage people to find their own answers to their own problems. And that, that way it becomes more worthwhile and lasts longer. But all the lessons that need to be learned are right in this community. Our teachers are right here. We don't have to go to West or United States or some other reserve to learn about tradition or lessons for about you know, culture. They're right here in this community. But in the old days, the way we learned it from our elders was you have to use discipline in order that children might learn not to do the wrong things. But you also have to explain why you're dishing out this discipline. If you intimidate children, they, they'll rebel. They'll do just the opposite of what you tell them to do. But if that same parent talks to their children gently or in a soft voice, those children will listen. But we <coughs> definitely have to get back to our own ways of handling our mental problems, our health problems. And that means we have to start right from a very early age. Everything has to start with the children. Because what you learn in the first two years of your life are the most important things. First of all, you learn how to walk. You learn how to talk. You learn how to think for yourself. Small, even a two-year-old already knows how to think for himself. So those are crucial years, those first two years of life. That's where you're going to learn 60% of what you're going to need for survival in the future. Everything else is secondary. Today we're going to talk about boys and girls. This is a wheezes, mabaget quizzes. And we're going to talk about your, like your body is your own. That's a very important sentence. My body belongs to me. And today we're going to be talking about that. There. Good. This whole part that covers the boy's swimming trunk, nobody else should touch, only the boy. Nobody else, okay? And we're going to talk about that little girl. She's also got parts of her body that nobody else should touch, only that little girl can touch her, those parts of the body. Can anybody come up and point to those parts of the body that nobody else should touch, only that little girl? Ha, huh, Charlene. Right there, right there. Very good. All the parts that cover your bathing suit, those are your body parts, and sometimes we call them private parts, okay? Because that's what they are. They're private parts. Nobody should touch them. I just want you to leave you with two things. If you, if you feel this is not safe, then it isn't safe, okay? You know how sometimes you feel this isn't safe? You think somebody's going to hurt you? Well, more than likely, somebody is going to hurt you, okay? And if you're feeling, say, oh, well, this feels good, and you feel really comfortable, and you're having a great time, well, then it is good, okay? So those are the two things you, I leave with you, okay? If you're feeling kind of scared, and you think somebody's going to hurt you, somebody is probably going to hurt you. So you get away from there, go, and then go and tell an adult if something did happen because that person will stop right away. If you let that person do things to you, he's going to go and do something else, or she is going to go and do something else to another child. And you want to stop that, right? not <laughs> Minage, 
the strength of the family is one of the things that's very powerful in our community, that uh, we help each other. And that's uh, a strength that we have to rely on and form the basis for our healing and helping each other and rebuilding the, the trust in the community is in the family. And that will extend out to the um, community because whatever affects us as an individual touches our families and touches the community. It's an area that um, sexual abuse is um, seeing uh, results using our traditional healing. It's not a long-term uh, therapy. It's usually the healing happens in one or two sessions with the healer. And the basis for that is the education to our people. We need to educate our people what, what it involves that, um, you know, recognizing that spirit and uh, making that spirit strong again and um, balancing the mind and the emotions and the physical well-being of, of ourselves. It is time for us to be honest and truthful and start to learn about our seven teachings that are very basic teachings but are tremendously difficult to incorporate in your daily life. Um, I, bravery is probably the, uh, the most difficult because you have to be brave to be able to tell a person, wait a minute, it's not right to talk about another person. Or um, when you hear backstabbing to tell a person, go and talk to the person that's bothering you or, or whatever the issue is, talk to them. It's been a rough life, but I have to say life's been good to me, too. And uh, the circles, I've just come out of one. I spent a day at uh, Sucker Creek, and, and there again I, I find how important women, women are, how valuable they are. It was a w women's conference, and I think there was there was only two men in there. I wish we had more men in those circles. It's not just for not just for women. But like like I told one of the ladies last week. Sometimes I feel uncomfortable when I when I'm sitting there. I've been into a lot of circles where where I'm by myself. Well, she said, you should be in your glory when you're there. So I, so I look at it that way. So today I did feel pretty good. I thought I was in glory. You know? I keep in shape. I um, just play sports at home with my little brother. And, and I play hockey and I play baseball. Who inspires me is my, my older brother, Lawrence, because you know, he seems like a good role model because he plays hockey and he's in school and he does get in school. My goal is to go play for Team Canada in the Olympics, women's hockey team. And that's all I have right now. Okay. Well, my parents have always supported me and they always will. And they're the biggest support a hockey player could have because in Sudbury, there's a lot of friends on my hockey team who uh, their parents just give them the car keys and they'd go to the games themselves while my dad and my mom, they usually drive up for every game that we play, if it's on the road or if it's in Sudbury, and they're always there. And well, high school has been, it's been pretty good, actually. I've been Manitoulin for one year and then transferred to Lockerbie. And well, there's a big difference because of Lockerbie, there's uh, more students and less teachers, and they, you're all big, one, one big family, and you gotta, everyone tries to help everyone out because there's like so many students in the classroom and what more help you get from your peers in the class, the easier school is. I think it's important for me to be active because uh, I'd like to be a role model someday and right now I coach little kids in baseball and they always look up to me and I have friends, I look up to them and they look up to me and life's important and you just gotta be ready for life. I love dancing because I dance for the elders. The elders can't dance, so they watch us dance. Um, I do it for the elders, and I do it for our tribe. 
The best song I like uh, is Sneak Up. If I do um, neat moves that I never uh, did before. I like being on the power trail because of the sights and I like the tacos at the powwows. <laughs> I feel about my culture proud and strong. Um, my mom and dad taught me how to dance. What I would like my friends to know is that dancing and going on the power trail is really fun. The first step to seeking help is to admit and acknowledge the situation. Another step is to get the correct information to make good decisions. A further step is to begin to seek the support you will need to go through the journey, such as counselors, support groups, or other resources. Rebuilding our relationships is a key factor in the recovery journey to prevent further breakdown and isolation. It is important to focus on our history of strength and spirit as Native people and to use the customs and traditions of our people that preserve the dignity and integrity of all. There was a woman at Wounded Knee She concluded with this prophecy Said there's something we're gonna have to do And I guess it's gonna all come true As she left and turned to go She saw a vision of a buffalo Rolled four times black, red, buckskin, white and I guess it's going to all come right. Our looking horse told this best as he traveled round from res to res. And we played strong at the music fest. He was a pipe carrier, 19th generation. From Saskatchewan by land and river. To the Black Hills, a message delivered. Riders dressed in unity, and I guess it's going to all.